Okay, so five Buddha families. Um, five Buddha families is a very interesting concept, which we're of course not going to cover just in one session. But um, when we're looking at these, you're going to start noticing them more and more if you've not had this teaching before, the way they're woven into everything in Tibetan Buddhism, the five colors, the five Buddha families, the five aggregates, the five wisdoms, five, 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 everywhere. And it's, it's a way of understanding the tantric worldview, which is that everything that is difficult about your own mind is also the very thing you can use for wisdom. So it's not that you change an affliction into a wisdom, that doesn't work. But what you do is you take the energy that accompanies an affliction and then bring a positive state of mind to it. So what we're normally doing in the sutra tradition is say you're working on your anger, okay? What are the antidotes to anger? Patience, loving kindness, the wisdom realizing emptiness, or meditating on the breath or walking meditation to diffuse right? Classics. So what those do is they kind of like punch a hole in the anger or interrupt the momentum of the anger or take the fuel of the anger away so that you settle. Yeah. Or prevents you from getting angry in the first place. And then when you are angry, your analysis kicks in and reminds you, don't say anything, <laughs> right? And then you settle down and then you do a proper analysis, whatever. Or if you're too angry to do any kind of analysis because your anger will co-opt your analysis, you walk or you do breathing meditation or something like that till it settles. Practical, straightforward, settling and soothing. In the Tantra path, what you're doing is you're saying, okay, there's a huge amount of energy in anger. And sometimes the affect or the appearance of anger can be a useful tool to kind of spark passion, to protect, to correct injustice, et cetera, et cetera. But the wish to harm, ill will, is always negative. The wish to harm is always negative, but the appearance of fierceness can be useful. I need to separate the two. Yeah, but still use that powerful energy to know what needs to be done. Okay, so how do I look at that differently? I remember emptiness. Yeah, and you're kind of also looking at what are the positive elements of something like anger that often get co-opted by anger into something negative. So like analysis, for example, when you're angry, you have a lot to say to yourself about why you're right and they're wrong and the whole story and everything it reminds you of and how people are crap, right? You have a lot to say to yourself. Now, what you're saying to yourself in that context is not useful, but your ability to do so is. So you're changing the content and you're saying, how about this analytical ability become sharpened and refined and married up to something like compassion. So anyway, so we'll walk through it, but just kind of looking at how all of our negative states of mind can have a parallel positive state of mind that can be developed and knowing what your classic problematic behaviors are can actually help open you up to what your greatest strengths might be. And that all tantric practices encompass and embody all of these five Buddha families, but they'll emphasize one in particular, which can sometimes mean when you're doing that practice, that affliction can arise more easily when you're distracted. But it also means that that wisdom can start growing a lot more specifically in a more emphasized way. So it's an interesting thing to start looking at. It's kind of like a personality type theory or something like that in psychology, but a lot deeper. Okay, so this is from uh, Lama Yeshi. He says, meditation on the five Buddhas or conquerors is visualized in tantric practice to purify the five aggregates or skandhas and to transform the five defilements of greed, hatred, self-importance, jealousy, and ignorance into the five wisdoms. So purifying them into, not transforming them into. The five aggregates are form, feeling, recognition, compositional factors, and consciousness. 
The five wisdoms are voidness, equality, individuality, accomplishment, and mirror-like wisdom. So there's some term variation here, and this is an old translation. So sometimes you'll hear defilements call, called um, disturbing emotions. And um, the aggregates or skandhas um, and wisdoms, these are sometimes getting slightly different names, like uh, the aggregate of recognition is sometimes called discernment. Um, and some of the five wisdoms have different names that are similar as well. But just to kind of get your head around the basic idea, then um, here's the heads of them, okay? <laughs> the heads. <clears throat> so we break them down into Akshobhya, Virachana, Ratnasambhava, Amitabha, and Amoga City. And when we're looking at the mandala, <clears throat> excuse me, on its own, here's the positions they go in. But in the mandalas of the deities that you're practicing, they're going to change around. And the one in the center is going to be the one that's emphasized. So it's not going to be that literally the five Buddhas are going to show up in every mandala, but the colors of the five Buddhas are. So the names of these families, Bhadra family, Tathagata or Buddha family, Jewel family, Lotus family, and Karma family or action family. Their respective directions and syllables, Yukum and East, Om and Center, Tram and South, Pri and West, Ah and North. So if you're remembering the Nungne Sadhana, when there's the bath offering, there's that little mirror and the Umze draws a little grid and does some dots. They go Om, Hum, Tram, Pri, Ah. Basically, they're saying all the Buddhas are here on this mirror that I place in the bath and then offer water to. And that's what they look like in Tibetan. And so here they are, and they each have thrones, and there are specific animals under each throne. And so under the yellow Buddha, Ratnasambhava, are horses representing loyalty is emphasized. Under Akshobhya, the blue one, we have elephants representing strength. Virachana, the white one, is sitting on lions representing courage. The red one, Amitabha, he's sitting on peacocks representing knowledge. And Amoga City is sitting on Garudas representing protection. So you'll see these, and sometimes you'll see these animals um, around the base of various stupas, and the meaning is usually the same. There's a little bit of variation. And then you'll see these hand implements, right? Everywhere in Buddhism, you're seeing these various symbols or hand implements. Sometimes in empowerments, you'll see them like on a plate as little statues. Sometimes you'll see them on uh, banners that are hanging. And they're again, representing the five Buddha families. So you have Ratnasambhava has a jewel or a norbu. Akshobhya has a dorje or a vajra. Virachana has a dharma chakra or a dharma wheel. Amitabha has a lotus or a pema. And Amoga City has a double dorje, although sometimes he has a sword. So in early Mahayana iconography, only a few main mudras or hand gestures were depicted upon sculpted Buddha images. And these became the distinguishing gestures of the five Buddhas in later Vajrayana iconography. So the enlightenment or teaching mudra was assigned to Virachana, the earth touching mudra to Akshobhya, the boon granting mudra to Ratnasambhava, the meditation mudra to Amitabha, and the protection mudra to Amoga City. So if you're looking at these Buddhas and they're all gold because they're all just statues that haven't been painted, you can't see their colors, you might be able to distinguish them by um, what their hands are doing. So Virachana teaching mudra, Akshobhya earth touching mudra, Amitabha meditation mudra, Ratnasambhava boon granting or generosity mudra, and Amoga City protection, refuge, or fearlessness mudra. And you'll recognize some of these hand gestures in a lot of the other Buddhas as well. So it's kind of nice to learn these mudras. So more importantly um, are the five wisdoms. This is the main core of this teaching. 
And these five wisdoms are the basic energies in their purified form, relating to the five aggregates and the five, quote, Dhyani Buddhas. So they are mirror-like wisdom corresponding to Verachana, the wisdom of analysis or discernment to Amitabha, equality to Ratnasambhava, achieving or swift activities in Oga City, Dharmadhatu wisdom to Akshobhya, and very important to realize is that these two are often swapped. So for whatever reason, the characteristics of Verachana and the characteristics of Akshobhya are switched in some traditions. So in our tradition, usually Akshobhya is related to mirror-like wisdom. Verachana is related to Dharmadhatu wisdom. It, at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter. I think it's important to just understand what these wisdoms correspond to in terms of their kind of distorted state. So when they're in their distorted or afflicted energy state, what are they like? And then what are they like in the flip side? So this is where it boils down to, do you ever feel that your best qualities and your worst behaviors are like two sides of the same trait? It's just something to sit with. Or maybe it's easier to see in other people that the things that you love about people and appreciate about them are also somehow related to the most aggravating aspects. <laughs> so he says, the Buddha families refer to factors of Buddha nature. In other words, they are Buddha family traits. They are inborn factors of everyone's mental continuum that allow each of us to become Buddhas. So on the basis level, they are unpurified, which means that their continuities are mixed with unawareness or ignorance and the disturbing emotions and attitudes. More specifically, they're mixed with the emotional and cognitive obscurations. So this is kind of where we're at with them, but not where we have to be. On the pathway level, they are partially purified and partially unpurified. So this refers to the Arya level when some of the obscurations have been removed forever. So Aryas are people who have realized emptiness directly. And then on the resultant level, they are purified. So they function unimpededly as the enlightening aspects of a Buddha. Okay, so as we do these, just really think personally what it's like for you. So mirror-like wisdom of Akshobhya. This is the mind devoid of dualistic thought, like a mirror and its reflections. And it's associated with the element of water and it purifies anger. So think about water elementally. Water can be boiling, it can be cloudy, or it can be completely clear and still. So water is just water, right? Water is not good or bad in and of itself. When it's a flood, it's destructive. When it's a clear stream, it gives us nourishment and life. So water is just water. So think about your energetic quality of water and kind of bring to it this idea of water being like anger and water being like mirror-like wisdom. Okay, so when you're angry, and you're boiling mad, all the little bubbles of the boiling reflect things. They reflect the world, but in a very distorted way, in a broken up way. When your mind is still and calm and free from anger, it reflects things a lot more clearly, a lot more accurately. There's a lot more space and stillness to assess things. So, when you're thinking about how do I work with this energy in daily life, you notice both sides of the coin. You notice that when this elemental quality of water is disturbed, it's not accurate. And when you remember that, it helps you to not believe in your anger. You stop believing what anger tells you. And then when you're calm and you're settled and you're feeling that stillness return to you, you know that what you're reflecting or what you're observing is closer to truth, at least relative truth. And so you trust yourself when you're calmer. And that kind of self-awareness of knowing when are you in your more distorted, afflicted side and when are you in your more evolved side 
helps you make decisions in real time that are a lot closer to virtue. Yeah. So then we have Amitabha, the wisdom of analysis. And some alternative translations are the wisdom of discernment or the wisdom of individuality. They all mean the same thing, but the wisdom of analysis is related to Amitabha. So this perceives the uniqueness of every phenomena. It, all the specifics, all the details, it discerns between this and that. And its associated element is fire and it purifies attachment. So think about fire. Fire can either be the thing that makes things warm and bright and cozy, or it can be the thing that destroys and consumes and is never satisfied, right? Like a forest fire just blazes through and anywhere it finds fuel it will eat and destroy it. So when it's in its afflicted side, attachment is like fire because it's always hungry, it's never enough, and it's incredibly destructive. Think about how your own attachment is. It's like it objectifies everything you perceive as giving you happiness or contentment, whether it's people or situations or objects or food or whatever it is, your attachment says, feed me. And then when you are fed by the person, the place, the situation, the whatever, it's not enough because fire will never be satisfied. It keeps eating and keeps eating and keeps eating. So attachment is like fire and it just burns through relationships, burns through resources, makes us kind of uh, deprived of the feeling of abundance. But then the other side of that is often people with a lot of attachment, the flip side is that in a good space, in a stable space, they're so warm. Yeah, there's warmth and there's brightness and they're able to kind of see the uniqueness of people and really help them feel seen and loved and appreciated. So if you're working with this in your daily life and you're feeling that kind of like fire, ask yourself, what's a way that I can make sure that this warmth stays in the wisdom of analysis and doesn't revert back to attachment? So how can I use this brightness of fire to see things clearly and to create warmth and coziness and kind of a hospitable environment for all sentient beings. So then we have uh, the wisdom of equality of Ratnasambhava, sometimes called um, the wisdom of equanimity. And this sees the universe as one taste in emptiness. And the associated element is earth. And it purifies pride. So distorted earth is like, you know, an earthquake and it crumbles up and there creates peaks and valleys and all of these levels. And that's what pride does. It puts people on all different levels and puts yourself at the very top. Yeah, the earth has become all crumpled and distorted and, you know, unharmonious. And when you're at the top of the mountain with your pride, you're also all alone. No one is good enough to be your friend. If somebody who is lower than you is your friend, you're like embarrassed about it. Um, it feels like you can't ask questions because you should already know better. So you're trying to preserve your reputation all the time. When you have pride, you also have all of this like fear of being found out. This feeling of I'm not good enough is often just pride. It feels like depression or something sometimes, but really it's your pride being afraid to be found out. So pride, when it's kind of in this elemental quality of positioning yourself so far above everyone else, you have to realize that the way you see yourself under the influence of pride is not how you exist. What pride does is it takes all of your best qualities on your best day, when nothing was wrong, when nothing was stressful, and it says, this is how you are, this is who you are. You on your best day, your best qualities, and then slightly exaggerated. And you identify as that version, 
but you're never been that version except for on one magical day 10 years ago or something, or maybe not even then. And so there's all this pressure to perform at that level of you on your best day or how you see yourself at your best. There's this pressure to stay on that mountaintop, but it's doomed to failure because you don't have all those conditions together yet. So you're forever disappointed in yourself or defensive about yourself. And it's just this horrible place of isolation and defensiveness. So if you're remembering the way that kind of like keeps you trapped above and keeps you sort of feeling paranoid and threatened, then it can make you want to switch to what is the healthy version? What's the more enlightened version? And that's that wisdom of equanimity, which makes the earth kind of flat. And we're not saying that there's like a problem with flatness or problem with mountains. We're not getting like that. We're just saying, think of it internally as an elemental experience of earth, okay? So if everything is flat, then you see everybody's equality, the way that they all want happiness, they don't want suffering, the way they all have Buddha nature, the way they all have innate ignorance, and everything else is just variations of that. But we're all the same in that way. And some people are closer to enlightenment, some people are further away from enlightenment, but that's not hierarchy, it's just conditions have come together for that. So when you're having this wisdom of equality, you get that beautiful sense of the human experience, the universal human experience and feeling connected to everybody. You don't feel suspicious or alienated or too different. You feel that sameness in the correct way, which doesn't mean you don't have surface uniqueness and stuff, it's all good, but you're really able to connect with the universal human experience in a deep way. And without pride, it's so much easier to be generous, to be abundant, not to be miserly, all of those things. So then we have the wisdom of achieving activities of Amoga City. Sometimes it's called swift wisdom or the wisdom of accomplishment. So same meaning, just alternative translations. And this is that spontaneous wisdom that works for the welfare of all. It's swift, it's quick, it jumps to the aid, it's efficient, it moves swiftly. And the associated element is air or wind and it purifies jealousy. So again, coming elemental to it. So think about how when you're anxious, the energy system in your body is very agitated, moves really, really quickly. Think about how when you're really, really tired and lethargic, the wind energy kind of feels Ugh. And then think about afflictions tied to wind energy. Okay, jealousy, what does it do? Jealousy moves back and forth between me and you, you who I'm jealous of, you who have more than me, who have more respect than me, who have more resources than me, who have more happiness than me, who have more beauty or wealth, whatever, whatever, education, whatever, whatever you get jealous about, jealousy is moving back and forth with this comparison. There's a lot of movement. And with that movement, there's not stability when it's in that distorted form, but it's quick. It's like, you have this, I have that. You have this, I have that. And it's just bing, 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 you know, back and forth and back and forth. When it's purified and when that energy then accompanies the wisdom of achieving activities, you become like Tara. You jump to the aid of sentient beings. So, of course, Tara belongs to the Amitabha Buddha family, but green Tara is green related to this air swift wisdom that spontaneously works for the welfare of all. So think of her foot out ready to leap to the aid of sentient beings. So that kind of efficiency that compares in the right way, that knows what needs to be done, that just acts. That's the wisdom that we get when we purify jealousy and in daily life we can kind of start to harness that moving comparison energy and ask ourselves, can we be more in alignment with swift wisdom? And then the last one is the Dharmatatu wisdom of Virachana. And this Dharmatatu wisdom is sometimes called all-encompassing wisdom, 
or the wisdom of the nature of phenomena or all performing wisdom or absolute wisdom or the wisdom of voidness, they all mean the same thing, but there's a lot of translation variations for this one for whatever reason. And this is that bare non-conceptualizing awareness, spacious, not spacey, right? Relaxed, not vague focused, not stressed, open. It's that open spacious awareness that is very, very accommodating, very flexible, can hold many things at once. And it's related to the element of space. And that drop is um, what represents it. It's a dissolving drop like the top of a womb, right? So like that. And it purifies ignorance. So if you're thinking about ignorance, if you're really being dominated by more than just the innate ignorance, you've got really manifest afflicted ignorance happening as your kind of default mode. What you are is kind of spacey and vague and disassociated and just not connected to the present moment in a very kind of loose way. So you might be kind of a benign, nice person, but you, somehow it's like people can't really connect with you because you're not really there. And when you're by yourself, you can't really connect with anything because you're not really there. You're just kind of spaced out all the time. So in its afflicted aspect, it's very hard to learn new things. It's hard to remember things. It's hard to get any tasks accomplished. And I think that we all fall into this mode fairly easily when we're alone for long periods of time. You know, you like walk into a room in order to do something, you start doing it, and then halfway through, you just kind of vaguely stop and move on to something else. You read a couple pages of a book, put it down, start dinner, forget about it. You know, you can get kind of just spacey. But the purified aspect is so powerful if we can start to connect with that and to invite that. Because the purified aspect is the mind that is able to understand many layers of things and hold many truths at once. Yeah, you're, you're sort of, you're not analytical so much as just open. Yeah, it's kind of the essence of open-mindedness, but in this very powerful way that is vivid and wise, not just kind of like goes with the flow in a kind of hippy-dippy way. Yeah, it's really spacious. So that's this one. So these five Buddha families, um, there's father and mother aspects, represent the manifestation of all Buddha's purified psychophysical aggregates, our environment, and the cosmos. So being related to elements is not accidental. We created this universe from our minds and then this universe has an influence on it and it goes back and forth and it's a little bit chicken or the egg, but we can start to come in control with even the elements of the earth by coming into control with the elements of our body and the way they're associated with the minds that accompany them. And so there's a female aspect of all of these, the five wisdom mothers. Some names will vary, but you have Vajravarahi, Lachana, Mamaki, Pandaravasini, and Samayatara. Again, the blue and the white are often swapped. And there's those fathers again, blue and the white sometimes swapped. So just to summarize all of this, this is from Kurti Sencha Rinpoche. He says, According to, according to Kurti Sencha Rinpoche, the five types of Buddhas are related to the five delusions, and the cessation of those delusions manifests as the deity. It can also be said that the five impure aggregates, having been purified, manifest as the deities. But here, the particular thing is the delusions. The purity of this mental continuum that is achieved by ceasing anger manifests as the deity Akshobhya. The purity of this mental continuum achieved by the cessation of ignorance manifests as Varachana. The purity of this mental continuum achieved by ceasing pride and miserliness manifests as the deity Ratnasambhava. The purity of this mental continuum achieved by ceasing jealousy manifests as the deity Amogasiddhi. 
and the purity of this mental continuum that is experienced by ceasing attachment manifests as Amitabha. Of those five, there's probably some that resonate more than others. Some that you're like, oh, that's me. And some that you're like, huh, I don't really relate to that. We all have all five, both afflicted aspects and sort of gradually developing wisdom aspects, but different ones will take turns having prominence. And all practices help with all five, but all practices emphasize one. So if you remember yesterday when we did the Chen Rezig practice, at certain points there were empowerments within the sadhana where we invite all Buddha family, all five Buddha families and their retinues with Amitabha as their principal. Yeah, and you're like, why is Amitabha the principal? I thought we were doing Chen Rezig. Anyway, I'm going with it. <laughs> but Amitabha as their principal is showing us that Chen Rezig belongs to Amitabha's Buddha family, the Lotus family meaning that the emphasis of Chen Rezig practice is purifying attachment, developing discriminating awareness, and the others as well. And so if you're looking at the mandala, you're gonna have probably a lotus in the middle, like that. So some of you know this teaching um, and some of you are new to it, um, do you have thoughts or questions about it? Um, what's the function or um, uh, why is the, the aspect of the female and the mother? Is it to do with father or mother tantra when you said about the five female? No, that's um, all, all tantras have father mother aspect. Yeah, so it's not related to father tantra or mother tantra. Um, and father tantra and mother tantra are not referring to whether the deity is male or female, right? Because Haruka is a male deity, but it's mother tantra, for example. So um, yeah, there were there's associations that seem like would be obvious, but are actually not the case. So like all things in tantra, you're trying to balance method and wisdom and integrate and unite method and wisdom. So the female aspect always represents wisdom. The male aspect always represents method. And both aspects are within ourselves as an individual and need to be balanced and united. Yeah. So, you know, whether it's an elemental quality or somehow a gendered quality or a practice quality, what we're wanting is integration. Yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's a good question because you think, what? <laughs> yeah, Claire, go ahead. Um, I was just wondering if there is a book or anything that would show us what you've just told us. It just seems to be so correct and just almost so, almost mind-blowing to think of how it all slots together. Um, and it's just like, how do I remember all of that? My, my go-to is the Five Buddha Families chapter in Chugyam Trimpa's book, Journey Without Goal. Yeah, okay. Journey Without Goal. It's just one chapter. It's beautiful. Um, there's kind of a, oh, I don't know. Sometimes I recommend this book, sometimes I don't, on using the five Buddha families in daily life. For super, super duper Buddhists, it might be a little bit too light, but I, I find it really interesting. So some of you might like it. It's, um, it's by Irini Rockwell. Yes, it's called The Five Wisdom Energies by Irini Rockwell. Um, there's also a good one by Rob Priest. It's called uh, The Mandala and Visions of Wholeness. And it's got a little bit of Jungian interestingness if you're a Jungian person, but it also talks about the five Buddha families in an interesting way, as does that uh, book by Geshe Tashi Sering called Tantra. It has a nice chapter on it too. So, so you'll find it peppered around. And um, Lama Sultram Alion um, also talks about it, I think, in like Dakini Wisdom or something like that. And she has some good YouTube videos about the five Buddha families. Um, and she speaks about it really eloquently. So yeah, it's, it's interesting, isn't it? And I think it helps us also relate to other people differently. You know, if we think, oh, you're always like that. <laughs> and then you're like, oh, wait, you're always like that. Oh, oh, you're always like that. <laughs> oh. Right? And then you think, okay, well, how can I invite the enlightened aspect? I'm not trying to change them. I'm trying to flip the switch to the other version of them, you know? 
oh, I don't have to change them. In fact, I can't change them. In fact, that has all been a fruitless exercise. What I can do is try to speak to their wisdom and bring that out. Yeah, and so then it becomes less of this kind of inner turmoil of that is so exasperating, you think, yes, which is the flip side of their amazing quality, which is why they're my friend in the first place, because it's such a cool thing to be around. It's just, they're not perfect. <laughs> Darn it. Wait, neither am I. Yeah. So it's, it's interesting. Hey, see you after lunch. <laughs>